Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Well, first of all, thank you very much for those uh, thoughtful and uh, important remarks. I think in in reading uh, your your book uh, shows about nothing. Uh, you you attempt to address. I, I think uh, rather you address very well the crises of nihilism in popular culture. And what I want to start off one is by uh, looking at the problem of nihilism, uh, which is a human problem. And I'd like to quote and then ask some of your reflections on this uh, from, I don't, are you familiar with Nishitani Meiji? You, have you read anything no. by him? No. Okay. Sounds He's like a Japanese. Ja <laughs> he, he, uh, he wrote a book called Overcoming Nihilism. It's actually really worth reading. But uh, anyway, he says, on the one hand, nihilism is a problem that transcends time and space and is rooted in the essence of human being, an existential problem in which the being of the self is revealed to the self itself as something groundless. On the other hand, it is a historical and social phenomenon, an object of the study of history. The phenomenon of nihilism shows that our historical life has lost its ground as objective spirit, that the value system which supports this life has broken down, and that the entirety of social and historical life has loosened itself from its foundations. Nihilism is a sign of the collapse of the social order externally and of spiritual decay internally, and as such signifies a time of great upheaval. Viewed in this way, one might say that it is a general phenomenon that occurs from time to time in the course of history. And he was writing in post-war Japan where they had uh, an immense crisis. So I, I'd like just maybe to hear from you about how this translates what I just read and what you wrote about uh, in your book in our current uh, crises. Yes, very, very good. Um, and, and that's a, a, a very succinct analysis. Just so everyone knows, nihilism as a term comes from a Latin word nihil, which means nothing. And it's typically taken to be a philosophy or a way of life that says that there's no ultimate purpose or meaning, no, uh, no fundamental standard to which we can appeal that enables us to distinguish between true and false, good and evil, even better or worse. And so it, it, is, uh, it can be the result of deep social, political confusion, spiritual emptiness. Obviously, it, when it's taught, particularly to young people, either as a philosophy or through the stories we tell, it can have a coarsening and indeed corrosive effect on the moral imagination of young people. And that's in part what I was worried about in the book, looking at examples from television and film. Uh, and I, I do think that we are in a time where, uh, where nihilism threatens us in lots of ways. I think our, even in our, uh, in our positive quest for justice, we've had a lot of talk since early summer after George Floyd about issues of, of racial injustice and mistreatment by the legal system, by police and by courts and so forth. A, a, and beneath that, uh, in in its uh, its deep authenticity is a great hunger for justice, but I think sometimes in our culture, when we talk about rights, when we talk about demands for justice, because we lack a consensus about what it means to be human, about what the foundations of justice are, whether they're in nature or in God, our our discussions about these matters have an almost hysterical character to them that borders on the irrational and is always in danger of bordering on violence because we, we lack a, a sense of the foundation of purpose. And so we're always, we're always sort of threatened by nihilism, whether we're aware of it or not. The one last thing I'd say about this is the, the first part of that comment from the scholar you were reading uh, uh, is uh, that the, the sense of one's own nothingness in religious traditions, I speak here, uh, especially in the Christian religious tradition, that insight into one's nothingness is a possibility of opening up into seeing one's very existence as a gift of the creator God. And so 
the 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 in the in the deep religion religious traditions of which we are a part that sense of nothingness is always part of our sense of ourselves because we are not self creators uh, right. because we are not fully autonomous uh, because we are not sufficient unto ourselves and so that sense of my own nothingness within the ambit of a rich theology and liturgy and practice of a meaningful religious life, that's, that is actually something that we are urged to have, right? We are urged to have a sense of our own nothingness and that our dignity comes from our being created by God and from our subordinate relationship to God as creator and judge. And so right. the, when, you, when you have the experience of nothingness apart from that theological framework, the risk is always that everything falls apart, right? That then it's just bare meaninglessness. I know you're a scholar of Pascal, and my father said that everybody should read the 72nd Ponce at least once in his life. And, uh, and, and as you're well aware, I mean, that's the one that deals with proportionality and this idea that the human being straddles these two abysses, the abyss of nothingness and uh, from, from which he came and the abyss of infinity by whom he came. And, and he argues in there that only God can know both nothing and infinity. We're incapable of that. And it seems to me that nihilism is people that are looking at the nothing and forget about the infinity. And they've, in a sense, turned their back on that. And uh, Frost has a wonderful poem about uh, the people that look out at the sea. Uh, they cannot look out far. They cannot look in deep. But wh whenever, wh whenever was that any anything that prevented them from doing it? And it seems to me that, you know, the, the, the nihilist is looking, instead of looking at the ocean of infinity, he's looking at the, the wasteland uh, on the shore. He's, he's looking the other way. And, and I think, um, you know, what you've pointed out in this is that our children, and, and Plato reminded us that give me the stories you tell your children and I'll give you your culture, that our children are growing up on a type of, uh, of popular culture that, that is so corrosive. Um, and over time, I can't see how they could not fall into a type of despair uh, that the, 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 uh, the meaninglessness of life that's presented to them constantly, uh, that, that that would be the result. And so I'm just, I'm curious how you see in terms of our institutions, these liberal arts institutions, how, how can we be better at doing what um, I think Comte has an essay on a pyrocalia, and uh, uh, Leo Strauss uses that term uh, when he talks about liberal ed education. The idea that vulgarity, which our culture has become very vulgar, and 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 vulgarity for the Greeks was a pyrocalia. It was inexperience in things beautiful. How do we restore? Uh, beauty to our to a culture that seems to have really lost it. That's a great question. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that one of my uh, favorite things about being with President Hamza is the the way he weaves uh, long quotations from poetry into all all that he does. I mean, there's uh, there's there is an eloquence and beauty, and that is one of the ways. Right? It's by adults speaking to young people, especially in our educational institutions. Uh, but more broadly, in ways that give them an appreciation of the beauty of language, right? We're using language all the time, and our language has become so coarsened that we don't experience beauty in it. They, um, the German philosopher Wittgenstein uh, has a great line, the limits of my language mark the limits of my world. And what liberal education offers to young people is an expansion of their vocabulary so they can actually not just 
impress pe people at cocktail parties and talk intelligently in meetings, but so that they can actually see the world in a richer way. You can look at something, a painting, a beautiful, uh, a beautiful building, uh, a, a great work of art, and if you don't have the vocabulary to describe what you're experiencing, you are to some extent insensitive to what you're experiencing, or at least you can't experience it on the deepest level. So giving students a vocabulary so that they can more richly perceive and understand and express their own experiences is one of the keys. It's also that vocabulary uh, and the stories and texts that we read in our curricula give students standards, give students a sense of what it would mean to pursue the truth, to pursue goodness, to pursue beauty. And at least after they've had that, they will have the grounds in everything else they're experienced for saying something's missing. Nihilism is being unable to say something's missing. There's a great line in Shakespeare's King Lear, this is not the worst so long as we can say this is the worst. The worst would be to experience something that's horrible and not even know that it's horrible. Right. Right. So to to give our young people at a minimum the ability to know that something's missing and to be able to start to articulate what that is from the resources that we've given them through our education. The real danger in our culture is that we sense that things are a mess, but we can't really name what's missing. And without an education, especially a deeply spiritual education, you lack the resources to identify what's missing. And you can even begin to lack the sense that something is missing at all. And the Quran's first commandment was read, iqra, to read. And I think Islam, uh, like Christianity, developed an incredible civilization of literacy. And that's why I, one of the things that Jacques Barzin in his, uh, in his book uh, From Dawn to Decadence, he has a chapter about what he called primitivism, you know, the kind of Rousseauian fallacy uh, where people um, look at very primitive life as some kind of an ideal. And, uh, and I, I think... That, that to me is a great uh, tragedy because the, the life of the mind, the fact that we are unique amongst uh, creation in that we do have minds and we have this ability to grapple with nothing and infinity as concepts, which is something that the God who created our imaginations gave us those imaginations uh, to be able to do that. And that's something so extraordinary. And to squander this incredible opportunity, I just, I feel for our young people because they're given relativism in schools, they're taught doctrines that this really is meaningless. And then they're told, on the other hand, about rights that they never ground in anything. And this is, leads me to my last question to you. I think you make a very powerful argument in, in uh, your book on dialectic that, you know, seeking the good uh, whether it's, you know, the moral virtues, the intellectual virtues, seeking the good requires metaphysics. And at Zaytuna, we, we do really try to give our students, you know, an introduction to metaphysics. So I'd really like you to talk about why metaphysics is so fundamental and important to the life of the mind. Yes. Yeah, so in the, in the tradition that we work out of, right, and you're right that uh, Albertus Magnus, Thomas Aquinas's great teacher, was immersed in, in the writers from your tradition. And, uh, and that uh, Aquinas could not have done his work without that training. And that was a training that saw these texts and commentaries on them as building up 
not as standing between us and reality, but as building up insight and vocabulary to be able to discern and apprehend the truth about reality more fully. And in this tradition, the more fully we apprehend it, the more deeply mysterious it becomes. That's a great paradox of metaphysics as it's understood in the Arabic Islamic tradition and in uh, in the Christian tradition, at least amongst the best practitioners in those traditions. Uh, without some sense, I mean, let me talk about this just in, in terms of our experience of people and our lives and then broaden out to something more substantive about metaphysics. Without some sense, and this is often where secular people begin to have quasi-religious thoughts and sometimes begin a quest for religion and conversion, some sense that there are layers, mysteries, coincidences on one level, which might be providence on another, that, that there are things that I'm not apprehending, levels of depth about my relationship with other people, about my own life, about good things that I've done, about evil that I have done. Without some sense of that depth perspective in our lives, our lives just become flat and meaningless and, uh, and listless, right? And without joy, without energy, without mystery. So when we have the sense that we're on a quest, as, as Walker Percy puts it in one of his books, to be on the quest is to be on to something. The sense that there's something more, right? That, that I can't quite apprehend, but it's, it's nagging at me. It's gnawing at me. It's pulling me. It's drawing me. That sense that there's something more leads ultimately to certain kinds of affirmations about reality as being deeper and richer than my immediate experience allows, but as being revealed to some extent in my immediate experience. And that's the beginning of metaphysics, the, the sense that there is a whole of which I am a part and that my one of my tasks as a human person in this great, vast mysterious cosmos where I find myself in a, on a tiny speck of matter called planet Earth for an infinitesimally small period of time. One of my tasks is to try and understand my place within the whole. That's right. metaphysics. That's well, the orientation well, of metaphysics. It's interesting that you're saying that because uh, in uh, uh, Nietzsche, who was dealing with, with the collapse of metaphysics, uh, in amongst the Europeans, um, he wrote in uh, the collapse of cosmological values that one of the he he gives these three different degrees of, of nihilism or nihilism, and and he says that the second one is a loss of 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 a holistic view of the universe that, that which is exactly to the point that you're making that this this is where nihilism arises out of it arises out of this loss. And in the discarded image, I mean, that's one of the things that C.S. Lewis yeah. talks about, is that the thing he envied most about the pre-moderns is they really had worked it all out and had such a holistic view uh, of, of the world and understood it within that holism. And so getting back to that, being whole again, I mean, it's interesting that healthy comes from whole. You know, the, the word, the root of that word is, is from the same uh, root that we get whole from. To be healthy is to be whole. And it seems that we're so fragmented.